Be Christianity. So how do we know the Bible itself, if that's where they're getting this information about Jesus and God from, what makes that religious document any different than a document that might be Hindu writings or Buddhist writings, because they all seem to claim that they are the authentic truth. Not only is its wisdom breathtaking in its beauty and its depth, especially in the Proverbs and the Psalms and Jesus' teachings, but the Bible is based on key eyewitness accounts. It has repeatedly been corroborated by archaeological discoveries. But as a historian of, of the Bible, I think there's very little that's factual. King David? No. Moses? No. I was simply objecting to the way the Judeo-Christian myth has permeated our society to such an enormous extent. Most scholars today think that the story, for example, of the discovery of the empty tomb is historical. Each writer has a perspective, an angle, sometimes an axe to grind. Is it fair to say that what they're doing is spinning the gospel? And if you want to call that spin, fair enough, as long as you realize that it's what we all do all the time. In other words, this is not a devious, cunning manipulation of events. They're telling the story in such a way as to bring out the flavor, to bring out the meaning. When you compare all of these copies with one another, they all differ from one another. Through its teachings, the Bible established a code of morality and justice, aspirations that resonate through the ages. More than fact or fiction, at the intersection of science and scriptures is a story that began over 3,000 years ago and continues to this day. Well, good morning. Good morning. So Pastor Kevin is away on about a 13-day trip. He and Sherry are in New Zealand as we speak. He was uh, preaching yesterday at a church in, I can't tell you the name of the city, uh, and that was right in the middle of something like 13 speaking engagements for each Kevin and Sherry. How many, Dennis? 22 and 13 days that they'll be speaking while they're there. And so he thought, hey, you know, while I'm gone, Roy, would you just take care of this little simple topic and why we should trust the Bible? So that's what we're doing here this morning. But I got a text from him this morning, uh, and it was such a sweet text. He says, hey, Roy, I'm praying for you, and I'm praying for our Monterey campus and our PG campus, that this would be a day that would be uplifting and encouraging in the Lord. And so uh, I'm just so grateful for that. And uh, then got another text from him right after the second service when he had watched this on live stream and, um, and he was still very kind. So we're going to continue on with that and see where we go this morning. And uh, today we're talking about whether we should take the Bible seriously. And week after week, Pastor Kevin and others bring us a message that's born out of the Bible. Our last three messages, Pastor Kevin spoke to us on the importance of the Bible in establishing our faith, our reason for gathering together as a group of Christians, and then using it as the basis for to talk about how do we live between now and Jesus' return, which is soon, right? You were here and you got that. Good job. So does Shoreline take the Bible seriously? And so here's the deal. You can go on the website and you click about, and then you click about Shoreline, and there'll be a drop-down menu and there will be nine statements on doctrinal or positional statements that we have on God, on human beings, on Jesus, on salvation, on eternal security, on the Holy Spirit, on the priesthood of believers, and our position on the Bible. And it'll be up on your screen. Here it is. About the Bible, this is what we say. The Bible is God's word to all people. It was written by human authors under the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is the only supreme source of truth for Christian beliefs and living. And because it's inspired by God, it is without any mixture of error. Now, I want to take one sentence out of that and just repeat it. It's the only supreme source for Christian beliefs and living. And I'll just say that arguably around here, we think the Bible is a pretty big deal. 
In fact, we think it's the real deal. But what gives us that confidence? How can we stand so firmly in this? Can we trust the Bible's trustworthiness? Can we rely on its reliability? Now, you might recall, you probably already know this, the Bible's made up of 66 books. There are 39 Old Testament books. There are 27 New Testament books. The Bible was written by 40-plus authors over a span of 1,500 years. What we're not talking about here this morning is how we got those books in there and why we, why we adhere to those, although that is fascinating uh, discovery and reading. I encourage you to go look at that. But what we are talking about is how scholars have tested the reliability of the books that we, that we hold as God's word and authority for our lives, how they got there. And, and here's the great deal. We live at a time in history where so much of the heavy lifting has already been done. Yes, there are still, still discoveries being made, things that are coming in and underscoring the things that we've already learned about it. But we get to enjoy the fruit of the labor, uh, labor of so many who have taken the path to authenticity before us. Now, what I want to do just for a couple of minutes here is, is we're going to take, if you look in your outline there, and you can see as it's written down in there, the word maps. And we're just going to take kind of a road map on what scholars have done in the past and continue to do to ensure and to underscore that the things that we rely upon are reliable. And we're going to start with the M in that. And the M stands for manuscripts. And manuscripts are the copies which exist of the original documents that are written by the authors of Scripture. Manuscript copies are not the original autographs. So how do we test the reliability of these manuscript copies? Pardon me. Must have been that muffin. Well, there are three primary tests. There are many others, but there are three primary tests. When we take these manuscripts out, we have three primary tests. The first one is the bibliographic test. Now, the bibliographic test simply refers to the number of documents and document fragments that we have and the time frame between their original writing, when the author originally wrote them, and the earliest copies that we have of those writings. So, for example, the book of Luke was written in the 60s, the, the, the original 60s, 60 AD, okay? <laughs> the earliest copies that we have of portions of the book of Luke are, are dated back to about 150. And then, of course, we have many other documents after that. So there's a span from the original writing, and as those were passed around and recopied, etc., that are about 90 years between that and, and the copies that we have of Luke's writing. And then they're, they're overlaid one after another with the other copies that we have in existence. And, and we're, we look at what is the, the, uh, the fluidity? What is the continuity? Where, how, how does it match up? Does it match up? As to the number of documents out there, there are almost 20,000 manuscript documents out there and manuscript fragments out there existing that cover every single book of the Bible. Now, some of those documents for the Old Testament, there are over 14,000 of those copies. Many of them date from about 800 A.D. And quite a number of them that date all the way back to 250 B.C. Now, here's an interesting thing. You've got all these documents that start in 250 B.C. that we can date, running all the way to 800 A.D. and beyond, a span of 1,000 years, and if we take, let's just say, the book of Isaiah, and we put the book of Isaiah from 250 B.C., and we line it up behind those that come at later copies, and we look at the continuity that takes place between those, we can begin to arrive at the fact that we've got a reliable document. If we've seen that continuity through all of those years, we've got something that we can trust, that we can stand upon, that we can rest upon to be the guidance for belief and practice. The New Testament documents number somewhere in the 5,000 range, and close to 800 of those can be dated prior to 1,000 A.D., and a fair number that date back as early as 150, 125. And we look at the quantity of documents, their breadth of time, and then the continuity of their content 
we find great evidence for reliability. But it's not just the bibliographic test. We can also look at the eyewitness test. Now, basically what that means is what's the internal evidence for the documents that we're relying upon? Now, it's most easily seen in, a, in several New Testament documents. Uh, one of them, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter declares, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He continues and he says, We ourselves heard this voice from heaven when we were on the mountain. Now, Peter proclaiming, and stating in there, we were eyewitnesses to this. And then he mentions a reference that goes back to Matthew's gospel, chapter 17, where Peter, James, and John are on the Mount of Transfiguration, where God speaks and he says, this is my son. And he's the real deal. The opening lines of the book of Luke discusses Luke's desire to bring us an accurate account. Let me read it for you. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that, we, that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the very first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seems good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. The Bible attests to, in, in many other ways as well, to the eyewitnesses of the writers. Yet some of us are going to ask this question. We say, how can you trust the book you trust to tell you that you should trust it? How can you trust the book you trust for it to tell you that you should trust it? So we go to outside or external sources. Scholars turn to the outside for confirmation from those who weigh in on similar and the same information. And the manuscript evidence is weighed by those events and people and places which are attested to by secular historians that are talking about the same topics at around the same time as the historical writers. So we have, for example, the Jewish historian Josephus writing in the first century, late in the first century, and we have several Roman historians who were writing early in the second century that are making statements that corroborate things that are in the New Testament documentation. For example, many of them talk about the reality of the man Jesus who they knew to have had an impact on those who, uh, on, upon his following. They attest to his death and even to the facts of the, the, of the, the regard to his resurrection. And then to many other things that are in the gospel records, these historians back up as historical fact. Now, we're just skimming the surface on these things. You can look for days. You can, you can take a lifetime to unpack this stuff. But understand that there is indeed, despite what the gentleman said on the screen, there is ample credible, credible evidence for the reliability of the documents that we use to stand upon. So the manuscripts, they are tested for their bibliographic, for their eyewitness, for their external evidence. But that's not all we rely on. We also look at what the archaeological record says. Now, here's just an example. I'll give you two of them. Here are two examples of where archaeology has come into play. The first one has to do with the book of Daniel. Now, the book of Daniel, for a period of time, was, was really kind of held at odds, no small part because of the king. Belshazzar. Now, if you remember King Belshazzar, he was the guy who was having this big party primarily because the enemy was coming upon them, and he figured, well, what's the best way to handle being attacked by the enemy? Let's go get drunk. And so he gathered around a thousand of his closest friends, and they even pulled out the goblets out of storage that had been taken from the temple in Jerusalem, and they are drinking and eating to, um, well, I guess really to celebrate the last, the end. And then remember the handwriting on the wall. And they call upon Daniel to come and say, what does this mean? And Daniel, he says, basically what it means is you're toast. <laughs> he says, forgive me, but this is, this is the deal. Well, for years, there were, there were, the scholars were saying, this is not true. We have no record of a Belshazzar. We have no record of, of even his life, let alone the fact that he was the king in Babylon. Well, guess what? 
in about 15, uh, when was it? It was uh, uh, 1854, between 1854 and 1888, four cylinders were discovered. Uh, see one of them up on the screen up there. And these cylinders have the history of Babylon written on them. And in one of the cylinders is addressed in there where Belshazzar's dad, king, has gone off to take care of other business for about 10 years and appointed his son, Belshazzar, as co-regent or co-king in his absence. Problem solved. So in many different instances, archaeology comes back and undergirds what the, Bible, what the Bible documents say. Now, the flip side of that, actually kind of a role reversal, if you will, the Bible is actually depended upon to attest to the archaeological record. In the early 1900s, about 1908, 1907, somewhere, Sir William Ramsey set out to document the geography of Asia Minor. In it, he ended up documenting and also depending upon the writings of the book of Acts to allow him to finish his task. Now, he had come out of, uh, out of an educational system that said basically the New Testament documents were bunk. But this is what he says at the end of his studies. He said, I began with a mind unfavorable to it. But more recently, I found myself brought to the, into contact with the book of Acts as an authority for the topography, the antiquities, and the society of Asia Minor. It was gradually borne upon me that in various details, the narrative showed marvelous truth. Uh, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. In the words of University of Yale archaeologist Millar Burroughs, he said, archaeological work has unquestionably strengthened confidence in the reliability of the scriptural record. More than one archaeologist has found respect for the Bible increased by the experience of excavation in Palestine. So we have manuscripts, we have archaeology, and let's just turn our attention to another area here, the area of prophecy. Now, this, in this area of prophecy, what we're talking about really is predictive ability. That is, to be able to predict events that could not be known or predicted by chance or by common sense. Now, those who track such things say that there are some 2,500 predictive prophecies throughout Scripture. And over 2,000 of those have already come true. If we look at just the prophecy on Jesus alone, there are over 300. Everyone born out in the New Testament record. Now, there was a professor back in the 50s or 60s, our, our 60s, back in the 50s or 60s, Peter Stoner, and he, he was a mathematician, and along with a group of about 600 or 100 of his students, they took eight of those predictive prophecies of Jesus, and they put them to the test, and they said, what would the odds be for this taking place, these eight things, for this to happen and for Jesus to be the real deal? The results of their study was that, that the odds for this were 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Now, that's 1 in 10 with 17 zeros past it. That's way beyond my pay grade for understanding what that number is. It's a lot. It's something like a bazillion or something. I don't know. But the odds for that to take place were astronomical. Now, I'll tell you that if you go and research that and go look into it, there are people out there who will debunk not only his findings, but they'll take each of those eight prophecies and they'll say, hey, look, here's how we can explain those away. Good and well. But to do so, we have to go back and dismiss the manuscript evidence, the archaeology uh, evidence, and we have to determine that our Bibles are nothing more than myths and fairy tales. That's the only way you can make that work. What it really says is that we can't take this book because there's some pretty wild claims in it that God is the God of miracles. So if we set aside God's miraculous, we have a real tough time standing on this. Except the evidence bears for us what the Bible says. 
so we can begin to stand on this in a way that gives us comfort and confidence. Final item, M-A-P-S. The S stands for statistics. And this is asking the question, is there statistical probability that the Bible is reliable? Well, that's really kind of what Peter Stoner's deal was. But here's another way we might ask it. How do you find 40 authors from a broad spectrum of life writing over a span of 1,500 years in a complex variety of circumstances, penned in three different languages on three different continents, consisting of dozens of controversial topics, and end up with harmony and continuity throughout? That's the statistical implications of that. And yet our Bible, from beginning to end, talks about God's love and desire for redemption of his people. So if this brief roadmap helps in determining that we can trust it, then we can go back to the question, should we? Now, remember what we said, the only supreme source for Christian beliefs and living, God's word, the Bible. So the Bible we now find to be trustworthy also tells us that it is purposefully profitable for us. Now, remember Luke's words? He said, I write so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. Or in the, towards the end of John's gospel, he says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Bible is the source of our Christian beliefs. But it's also the source of our practice, of our living. Let's take a look at what the, word, the Apostle Paul said to his charge, Timothy, in in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, I want to pause for a second in that. Look at that line. It says, God-breathed and is useful for teaching. Now, when I first learned that verse, I learned it in a translation that said that it was profitable for teaching. You might have a translation that you've read that says that it is profitable for doctrine. Well, which is it? Is it useful or is it profitable? Is it for teaching? Is it for doctrine? What's that about? And it, does it affect the trustworthiness of the word? Well, let's face it. Every one of our Bibles is a translation from another language. The original documents were written in Hebrew. For the Old Testament. In the New Testament, they were written in Greek. And there's Aramaic scattered throughout both of those, those, uh, those documents that, that uh, all three of those languages were used in the development of our Bibles. The earliest, and actually, as I stop and think about it, there's not a lot of Aramaic or Greek or Hebrew that's spoken around shoreline. At least I don't hear it too much in our hallways. Occasionally, you're going to hear a little bit of Arabic, a DLI student that's just kind of cramming for that oral exam, and you will you might hear the strains of that. Or maybe a little bit of Spanish. You come on Sunday night for Iglesias Shoreline or, or that group as they're gathered around here. But the earliest translations went from Hebrew to Aramaic in about 400 B.C. They went from Hebrew to Greek in about 250 B.C. And about 600 later, years later, both of those Hebrew and Greek manuscripts were translated into Latin. It wasn't until 1380 that there was even an English translation. And in the 1900s, there just seemed to be kind of a plethora of English translations of, of many different kinds and stripes. Well, for continuity's sake, at Shoreline, we've, we've, uh, we've made a determination that what we'll use from the platform, what we put in print, is that we'll pull our, our documentation, we'll rely upon uh, what would be known as the 2011 New International Version. Now, there have been three different uh, iterations, uh, updates of that, none of them changing the content, but basically staying current with archaeological discovery and with current usage of the English word. So is our NIV, 2011 NIV, unique? Well, yeah, and no. Uh, no, in that the fidelity and accuracy of the translation, it's a high value and it's a high goal, but that's the value and goal of most every other translation that there is. New American Standard, New Living Translation, I mean, there's a, whole, there's a gamut of them. 
They all strive for that. But it is unique in that it draws from both discoveries and developments in biblical scholarship and English language usage that changes in time so that we would have an accurate and reliable and readable translation. But let's go back to the text here. It's profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. And we said that that word teaching could be either it could be uh, translated teaching or doctrine, either one of those. And either one of them applies and you say, well, what do I do with that? And so it might be easier for us to look at that word teaching in contrast to the last one, training. At least it helps me to think about it this way. Uh, teaching is that body of language. It's where we hang our hat. Training is how we wear our hat out in public, how we live out our lives. Teaching is, is the doctrine. It's the content. Training is how we live it out. And then in between that, we've got two items there, rebuke and correction. And those two, they kind of go hand in hand. On the one hand, rebuke, or another word we might use is reproof, tells us where we've gotten off course, where we missed the mark. It's the ouch of Scripture. And then on the other hand, we've got correction, and it shows us how we get back on track. So if we turn to, say, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, come up on the screen there, we really show both of those coupled up together. It starts out with this, get rid of all, ma- all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. That's rebuke. Ah, don't do that. But be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Correction. I really appreciate um, Albert, Bar- uh, Albert Barnes wrote, uh, he's the author of, of, of many, uh, many commentaries, but he writes uh, Barnes, Barnes Notes on the New Testament is one of his collections. He states it this way about this little passage. He says, we need not only to be made acquainted with the truth, teaching, be convinced of our error, rebuke, and to be reformed, correction. But we need to be taught what is right, or what is required of us in order that we may lead a holy life, training in righteousness. Now, these things that make the Bible profitable, the teaching, the rebuking, the correction, make it invaluable to us for training in righteousness. But the passage does not stop there. It's just not so that we have that or we know that or we live that, but how we bear it out through our lives. It says so that we can be thoroughly equipped. That's our goal that we can be about the business of doing God's work. And how do we recognize those works? What do we do with that? Well, we can turn back to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 10, it says, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, when I learned that verse again, it was, I learned, for we are God's workmanship. Now, is it workmanship or handiwork? Same thing. It's just a different way of stating that. What is it that resonates with you? Are you his workmanship? Would you prefer to be known as his handiwork? Either way, he has prepared a life before us if we will embrace it. And here's what I believe. The more we engage with scripture, the more we are taught, the more we are rebuked, the more we're corrected and trained in righteousness, the more we are ready to recognize the things he puts before us, to live out our lives in a manner that are good works that bring glory and honor to him and to delight to those around us. But what happens if we don't? What about when we don't take this, the Bible, seriously? What are the potential results? And for firstly, I think that we'll take little to do. We'll look, look, pardon me. It seems like after three services, there's no tongue left. I have great appreciation for Pastor Kevin getting up here each week and being able to talk to you for three services and just fly. (laughs) But we would think little of looking to the word for our teaching. We would disdain any rebuking that came from its pages. We'd consider his correction to be suspect. And we would look elsewhere very little for any source of training that would put us on a right path 
path towards God's design and desire for our lives. We need to trust upon it. We need to allow it to infuse and infect us and guide and direct us. But many have done just that, walked away from that. We depend on our friends and our feelings and our fortunes to provide a course correction for our future. Well, as we were preparing for this, I, I went back and uh, did some rereading of a, of a work that Bruce Wilkinson did uh, called Experiencing Spiritual Breakthrough, and he talks about three chairs. I want to close with this this morning, and I know we're getting pretty close to being out of time, but I hope you'll bear with me just for a couple of minutes here. These are not Bruce's chairs. These are chairs out of our first grade classroom, but I think they'll suffice for what Bruce was trying to talk about. He starts the conversation with the man Joshua. Now, you know Joshua. He was general over all Israel towards the end of his life, but he started out as a slave in Egypt. He became the sidekick of Moses. He was a spy going in to scout out the promised land, and he became the supreme commander over Israel by the end of his life. And we have in the biblical record, you get to the end of Joshua, uh, chapter 24, verse 15 says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And as he stood there, he talked to the people and he said, this day, you got to choose who it is that you're going to serve. Is it going to be the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? Is that where you'll serve? Make your choice. Here's what the people said. Us too. They said it twice. Us too. And then the next verse, in, in uh, verse 31, it says, Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Wow. Joshua. God had impact on his life, and Joshua and the elders had impact upon the nation Israel. For Joshua, it was full commitment. But the nation Israel was compromised. They were given a directive to go in and take the land, and they did not do that. There were still people settled in the land. They were following after other gods. And after a season, as they mingled with those people, as they were neighbors, and as they celebrated with them, they invited their sons and daughters to marry their sons and daughters. And they began worshiping the gods that were still in the land that the people worshiped there. Now, fake gods, not the not the one true God, but they, their hearts were compromised by that. And they began to slide. And then somewhere between us two and Judges chapter two, we see great devastation. Look at the screen. After that whole generation, right here, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and served to Baal. They had gone off to other gods. Tragic. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob was nowhere to be found. Interesting thing. We can also look at the, at the uh, biblical record. We can look at the Old Testament record of, of uh, King David. When K King David was chosen, when he was selected to be king, God's own words were, this is a man after my own heart. Now, was David perfect? No. In fact, he did some despicable things. But when the reproof came and he was held before it, there was coarse correction in his life. He fell on his face before God in repentance and was restored and was a man after God's heart. And then the mantle passed from David, a man who was committed to God, the mantle was passed from David to his son Solomon. And Solomon started well. When God asked him, how are you going to serve? He says, oh, give me wisdom to lead a people. And God granted his request. I need to read you something, though, way back in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 17, verses 14 and following. You can go back and look at, read the whole thing later, but basically it says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and you've taken possession of it and you settle in and say, let us have a king over us like the other nations, be sure to appoint one that the Lord your God chooses. David was that choice. 
Further on here, he says, don't place foreign gods over you or one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. Further, it said, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll the copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord. Do you want to know something about Solomon? 40,000 horses, many of them coming out of Egypt, which was the place to get horses. 700 wives, 300 concubines, many of them from surrounding nations, which he erected uh, temples and, and steels to their gods. He amassed a fortune for himself that if we were to calculate today would be somewhere in the area of $4 billion. Not for Israel, for Solomon. There was compromise. There was slide. If you go and read about Solomon's son, Rehoboam, by the time you get to Rehoboam, God is not in sight. In fact, Rehoboam's selfishness and disregard for God caused the fracture and split of the nation Israel. Ten tribes broke away. He still got to rule over a couple of them. But this was devastation. In Joshua's day, this disregard for the God of Israel caused 400 years of turmoil. In David's day, the disregard for the God of Israel caused 400 years of turmoil. What are the implications for us today? I don't know that our lives will have kingdom cracking consequences like David's did. But the same thing is happening in our lives. What chair do we sit in? Do we sit with, with commitment and conviction to who God is? Do we have a relationship with him that is beyond no other? Are we molded and shaped by his word? Does God have first place in our decisions and ours is second? Do we submit to the authority to the Bible in the things that we do in our lives and our actions? Do we live life of compromise? Is God an acquaintance? Is it something like you feel an obligation that you have to be here on Sunday morning? Are you shaped by the words of other believers around you and their take on things? When you decide the things that you're going to do, do you choose your heart first and then maybe ask God, is that okay? Or I hope you don't mind. Maybe you're in the place of Rehoboam. Dad didn't set a very good example. And you're out here in this conflicted territory where God? Who is that? No relationship, not even a passing acquaintance. But there's something that just says, well, I guess I got to figure this thing out. What chair do you sit in? Is it commitment? Is it compromise? Is it conflict in your soul? Uh, guess what? It is so much easier to jump from the third chair to the first chair than it is from the second to the first chair. So if you're sitting here, hmm, God's word says that God demonstrated his love for us 
in that while we were still in this conflicted state, Christ died for us. And he says, I just want you to trust that for yourself. Move from conflicted to committed. If you sit in this chair, the impact of the things around my life, hey, it, this is a good life. Yeah, I'm here on Sunday mornings. Those donuts are great. The coffee's good. The fellowship's awesome. I love John's music. And I get something out of Kevin's message, and it sends me off to get into my week. But read the Bible? Well, what would a next step be for you? Maybe it'd be to just take a copy of the Bible reading plan. It's a 50-day plan. It opens up, it just tracks you right through what you could do to read. You can even get it online if it's easier for you to do that there. And let me make a, a, perhaps a proposal to you. If you need somebody to read along with you, and you don't have anybody in your life that will do that, send me an email, R-P-I-N-A, R-P-I-N-A, shorelinechurch.org, and say, hey, Roy, I'd love to read along with you. Can we do that? Now, you may read at your house. I may read at my house, and we can just email back and forth, what would you read today? Or we can meet for coffee once a week or whatever you want to do. But get into his word. Trust it, and then let it become part of you. Oh, maybe you are into that. Maybe you're already reading your Bible daily or just on a regular basis. And you made a commitment to Christ, but you just kind of sit at a crossroads where you've never made an outward declaration to things. Good news for you. Coming up in just a couple of weeks, Friday the 3rd, I think is the date. Friday the 3rd is a family baptism class. We do that for kids, but it's the whole family gathered so that everybody gets the same information. Or on that Sunday the 5th, at uh, 1 o'clock, there is a, an adult baptism class. It'll take place in a room that's just down the hall here, 1104, I think is what we designate it. The room number's not important. It's just down the hall, okay? But maybe this is the time where you move from second to first chair and making a declaration that this is a commitment in my life. I want to be a vibrant follower of Christ. Maybe you're in the first chair. I hope that you are. Oh, I so desperately want to be a grand first chair person. Oh, it's tough. It takes work. It takes commitment. The kind of commitment that Joshua had, the kind of commitment that David had, the kind of commitment that God desires that you and I have. And if you're in that chair, maybe your part is to just pull this person over and say, hey, I'll do that Bible reading with you. How about if we just meet and have coffee once a week and talk about what's happening in our lives and how God is influencing it and impacting it? It'll make a world of difference. What's your chair? Which one do you want? Just get to make a choice on that. Well, let me pray with you. All right? I'm just hoping that you will find that the Bible is reliable enough to jump in with both feet and let it infuse your life and guide and direct it and then live in a fashion that brings him glory and honor and that you can celebrate it. Let me pray with you as we close. Father, uh, the chairs are important that we recognize where it places us. But what's more important, Lord, is what we do with the chair that we're in and how we move from it or celebrate that we're in it. And so my brothers and sisters here today, I, I just pray that they'll take a little bit of recognition and then determine what you would have them do with that. And then your strength, <laughs> your infusion into their lives would move them in a way that would bring you honor and glory and would bring fruitfulness and fulfillment in their lives. And for that very thing, Lord, we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. And all his people said, amen. amen. Blessings upon you as you go. If you're here for a first time out here at the Connection Center, just off to the left, they've got copies of that 50-day reading plan. And if you'd like prayer on anything at all, there'll be some prayer partners up here in the front. We'd love to have you come and just chat with us. Okay. Blessings upon you as you go.